Good morning. Thanks for taking an interest in this presentation and in the lake trout restoration program on Lake Ontario. I'll be presenting data from the U.S. side today, not from the Ontario side. And the work on the U.S. side is a collaborative uh, effort between three agencies, the U.S. Geological Survey, the New York State DEC, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and two boats, the USGS RV Keho and the US, uh, New York State DEC RV Seth Green, and of course the capable uh, vessel crews of each boat. Before I get started, just a couple of notes. Um, about the effort uh, between 2018 and 21. Uh, there was no July uh, bottom trawling in 2020, reduced effort uh, in the July trawling in 2018, and only trawling in the Niagara Bar in 2021. And in 2018 and 2020, um, gill netting was only done at the eastern sites. Um, and the reason for the reduced effort uh, in those years was um, that the KHO was. Um, getting maintenance uh, in 2018 and in 2020 of course uh, COVID was a problem. The assessment data presented in, in this presentation responds to uh, the 2017 fish community objectives and later responds to uh, some of the elements of the 2014 management plan. Uh, lake trout are in uh, Section 3O in the fish community objectives under the deep pelagic and offshore benthic zone with the goal to protect and restore the diversity of that zone uh, in regards to na self-sustaining native species with a specific objective for lake trout to restore self-sustaining populations and provide rec recreational fisheries. There's three indicators for the, uh, the lake trout program and I'll be pre presenting on two of them in this talk. Uh, the catch and harvest indicator um, will be presented elsewhere in Mike Connerton's report. The only thing I'd like to say about the catch and harvest indicator at this time is that um, since the slot limit went into effect in the early 1990s, catch and harvest has been low. The main management tool underpinning the program is, of course, stocking. Lots of changes through time. And, and at least 11 strains stocked through the time period. Uh, targets were first established in 1983 with the 1983 plan and calling for a 1.25 million uh, spring yearling equivalents, which was later reduced in 1993 to 500,000 uh, due to uh, concerns over productivity and the prey fish community. Uh, that was crystallized in the 1997 plan and maintained until the 2014 plan was uh, put into operation and that raised stocking to 800,000. Uh, that was to be a mix of both fall fingerlings and spring yearling equivalents uh, and that responded to declines uh, that were experienced in the adult stock during 2005 to 2007 and a desire to reevaluate survival of uh, fall fingerlings and their suitability to use in the program. Uh, due to uh, further concerns over the prey fish community status, uh, stocking was decreased again in 2017 and then again in 2020. The current level is 320,000 spring yearling equivalents and the current mix is made up of um, a couple Seneca-like strains. Of course, the, the Senecas themselves and the Lake Champlain strain. Um, and then two strains that were brought on once uh, the superiors were um, pulled out of the hatchery system, the huron Perry Sounds and the Klondikes. Uh, the huron Perry Sound strain is um, a strain that was developed out of a uh, native strain that persisted through the, um, the decreases in the population in Lake Huron and has recently um, been um, recognized as a restored self-sustaining strain. And the Klondikes are an offshore humper strain in Lake Superior that uh, inhabit deeper depths than the leans. Um, and in fact, they were brought in a little bit earlier than the superiors uh, um, were removed from the system. And um, they were brought in 2008 after um, the experience in Lake Erie where they had done quite well. And in fact, they're doing quite well in Lake Ontario, surviving to adult ages at rates higher than most of the other strains. Most basic indicator in both the FCOs and the management plans is the adult abundance. And I'm showing you on the left uh, the CPUE from gillnets with the matures, uh, the gray area, and the immatures, the white bar. 
the time trend um, reflects a decrease, um, pretty dramatic decrease we saw in the mid-2000s between 2005 and 2007 that was likely due to enhanced sea lamp predation. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, but also, uh, it has been responsive to stocking levels as well. Um, the declines in stocking in 1993 were experienced uh, in the adult stock uh, starting in 1998 and persisting through uh, 2005, and we expected that time lag because um, they don't mature in Lake Ontario to age six. Um, the recovery was likely slowed um, due to um, two reduced stockings in 2005 and 2006 due to problems at the hatchery. Uh, this decline is likely due to the missing 2011 year class, and that all sets up um, what we're expecting from the decreases uh, starting in 2017. Uh, those are likely to start um, showing up in the adult stock um, next year um, with decreases um, over a few years. And, um, of course, that's, that's the target. Um, the stocking was purposely reduced to reduce uh, predation pressure by lake trout on uh, Alewives, and uh, we expect to, to see that play out over the next couple of years. Well, the more um, critical management tools continues to be the multi-agency sea lamprey control program performed by the Fish Commission, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and uh, Department of Fisheries, Oceans Canada. Uh, again, in 2021, uh, the program achieved exceptional control in Lake Ontario, bringing wounding again below target. Um, what I'm showing you here in, in the graph, the green area is the host CPUE, and that's uh, lake trout greater than 433 millimeters in length. Um, the black line is uh, the A1 wounding rate uh, per 100 lake trout, number of wounds per 100 lake trout. A1s are fresh wounds um, that uh, are um, indicative of an interrupted attack. Uh, you can see the big increase in wounding here and the decrease in the adult stock. It occurred between 2005 and um, 2007. And then the recovery of the adult stock as um, the control program was able to bring sea lamp under control once again. And in fact, in 11 out of the last 14 years, uh, wounding has been below target. And in the other three years, it was either near or, or right on target. So exceptional control continues in Lake Ontario, and it really is a critical element of the program. One of the more important indicators from the management plan is um, the CPUE of large mature females in the stock. Um, the target is a CPUE of two. Um, that was uh, set in the 1997 plan and developed based on the level of um, females in the stock in the early 1990s when wild uh, juveniles first started showing up in the bottom trial program and the size of the mature females is reflective of age seven and older lake trout in Lake Ontario. And in, since 2010 with the recovery of the stock out of that hole in 2005 to 2007, um, been at or above the target, which um, indicates uh, a high potential for the production of wild recruits in the lake. Most direct evidence of a successful program would be the establishment of a self-sustaining stack, which is yet to be achieved. Um, you thought we would have gotten it in the, uh, near uh, nearly 50 years um, that this program has been ongoing, but what we have achieved recently is the plan measured an increase wild juveniles above the levels seen up through 2011. You can see a large increase be beginning in 2014 in this inset graph. This is data um, from 20. 20 and, and years before that. Um, and that increase, um, while it was lake wide, it was mostly concentrated at two sites off the Niagara Bar. Um, and a couple other things to notice about this graph is the reduced effort in 2018 and 2020 has impacted the catch rate, no doubt, there. But in 2019, we saw a big decline in the catches uh, when effort returned to normal. There's no 2021 data because the uh, Lake Ontario Technical Committee uh, recommended uh, discontinuing this survey and uh, applying those resources to more pressing issues in the lake. But um, 
we thought it was important to go back out and to the Niagara Bar and examine whether or not these catches were in fact declining or persisting through time. And the USGS boat, the RV Kale, was able to get down to the bar last July and uh, spent a couple days trawling there. Uh, and the differences um, between the two graphs are a couple of things. One, this this is catch per per tow time in a restricted depth range where effort was const constant between years. Um, the catch is split between the west and the east side sites of the bar, with the west being in white and the east is in black. And the size range has been narrowed to 85 to 313 millimeters, which reflects a uh, size range where we're pretty confident that we're seeing um, age, zero, age ones and age twos, just age ones and age twos. Uh, the good news here is uh, catches returned to high levels in 2021. Um, and, and the other thing um, we saw with these catches is that um, they switched from a pattern of being larger on the east side of the bar early on to a pattern of being larger on the west side of the bar in more recent years. Uh, it's an interesting uh, trend, uh, one that merits further examination, and we'll be looking to um, the other surveys in the future to see if this continues. While those juvenile catches in the bottom trawl off the Niagara Bar certainly are encouraging, they don't meet the progress in indicator for the FCOs of increasing populations of wild lake trout across the range of age groups sufficient to maintain uh, and the self-sustaining populations. Uh, and to measure that, you, you need to look towards the gill nets because the trawls are efficient at catching larger individuals. And what I'm showing you here is the same trend that I showed you in the earlier slide of mature adults through time. So that's CPUE in September gill nets of mature adults, age six and older fish. And then the proportion of the mature individuals um, that were not tagged and not marked, didn't have code wire tags. Uh, and we strongly suspect um, from the way we um, examine these fish, looking for fin erosion, um, deformities and coloration, and the fact that uh, in the early 2000s, um, we examined uh, a number of these fish with otolith, otolith microchemistry, and we're fairly confident we are looking at wild fish. However, the trend, um, has remained uh, at about two to five percent of the stock throughout the entire time series. Um, we really no increasing trend except uh, um, during the period when the adult stock stocked population declined in 2005 to 2007. And this increase isn't an increase in the catch of unclipped individuals. Uh, it's the proportion of the stock going up because um, the denominator, the number of stock fish is declining. The other thing here that we expected to see when we split out the Niagara bar catches from the lake wide catch was an increase on the Niagara bar, those fish that we were seeing in the trawl since 2014. However, we didn't see those fish. And this really is indicative of, of an issue that's been ongoing, a bottleneck at early life stages, and it's become a thrust of the lake trout um, task group of the Lake, Tra or the Lake Ontario Technical Committee and um, Dmitry Gorski will be talking about some results from the task group. And so I think I'll leave you with um, that here and turn it over to Dmitry. Thanks. Good morning and thanks Brian for that great lake trout update. For the second part of this talk, I was asked to give an update on the Lake Trout Working Group. My name is Dmitry Gorski. I'm the chair of the working group. And before I get into it, I'd like to recognize the agencies that had staff that contributed to this working group. New York State DEC, USGS, US Fish and Wildlife Service, Ontario Ministry of Nor Northern Development Mines, Natural Resource and Fisheries, and New York Sea Grant. Lake Trout Working Group was established in the summer of 2020 and began meeting bi-weekly. The group was formed using an inclusive process inviting all interested parties to become members. Our first steps were to review current ongoing assessments and understand what information those assessments provided. Next, we reviewed previous management plans, reports, and publications to see what impediments were identified previously. The goal was to develop an understanding of the current state of lake trout populations. As you saw in Brian Lantry's 
previous update, the group observed that many of the targets are currently being met, especially the ones pertaining to the adult stock. Yet, we're still seeing low levels of recruitment from natural reproduction. So the group began discussing where we believe impediments may be occurring. Uh, this schematic here shows that these two green check marks here by the stock juveniles and stock adults, they represent assessment data. We have good data that say that when we stock juveniles, they have decent survival, and then the survival to adulthood is, is strong and provides a, a significant adult stock. Where we don't have very good data from the assessments is when it comes to the wild adults and wild juveniles. We see very few wild adults annually, and the wild juveniles we're only seeing in one area of the lake near the Niagara River. Furthermore, the question marks here by eggs and post-embryo uh, life stages represent a gap in our assessments right now. We don't have any assessments that are looking at those uh, life stages. And so the group came to the conclusion that the impediment to natural reproduction is occurring at the early life stages. We had lots of discussions about what could be happening. We developed several hypotheses, as you can see listed here. But ultimately, what we wanted to do is develop research priorities to address some of these hypotheses. And so we drafted a document of research priorities based on our discussions. We sent it out for external review from a few experts and edited according to their, their comments. Uh, this document, this draft document has been submitted to the LOTC co-chairs for review. And the goal is to have that document submitted to the LOC chairs shortly for an official management response. So the next steps following that is to have a workshop of invited experts where we can review the research priorities and develop a work plan of studies to address these priorities. The work group identified a couple initial research steps that were sort of fundamental to the future projects and investigations. The first one is to evaluate, to find spawning locations that are being used. And specifically, we want spawning locations that are easily accessible during spawning season and hatch out. We wanna be able to use these uh, spawning locations as study sites in the future. So currently we don't necessarily know where good study areas could be, where we could see egg deposition and uh, post embryo emergence. And so second research step that the working group was interested in was to evaluate the techniques that are out there to sample embryo and post embryo lake trout, specifically looking for something that's easy, efficient, uh, preferably boat deployed. And so these will all, this will be a foundation for many future studies. Thank you for your time and listening to my update. I'm hopeful that I can answer some of your questions.